Today's discussion will be presented in three sections since we are recording it for a radio broadcast on Federal News Radio 1500 AM. You're welcome to post questions and comments during the session and we'll try to answer them online. I'd like to introduce our moderator, Tom Temin, host and managing editor of the Federal Drive on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com. Welcome and thanks for joining us. My guests today are Servio Medina. He's chief of the Cybersecurity Policy Branch at the Defense Health Agency. Mitchell Komaroff is principal advisor for cybersecurity strategy, planning, and oversight for the Defense Department Chief Information Officer. And Keith Johnson is chief technology officer and chief engineer for the Defense and Intelligence Group at Lidos. And it's good to have you all here. And let's start with just giving us a quick background on, first of all, what your job entails and uh, what you're seeing in the threat landscape these days, because this is something that's morphing, changing all the time. Mitchell, why don't we start with you? Thank you, uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Uh, I work in the, uh, the office of the DOD uh, CISO. Uh, Ms. Uh, Essie Miller is our, uh, is our CISO, and that's in the office of the, uh, of the uh, DOD Chief, Chief Information Officer, uh, who is uh, the acting CIO is Dr. Uh, John Zancardi. Within uh, our organization, uh, I uh, support uh, Ms. Miller by uh, overseeing uh, the operations of our uh, risk management activities uh, performed by one of our directorates, our portfolio management, uh, as well as our strategies and plans. Um, and regarding the threat landscape, uh, as, as, as you know, uh, the cybersecurity environment is a rapidly changing technology environment uh, where we've pivoted uh, over the years from isolated uh, information technology systems that support operations to what has emerged as cyber where all operations are embedded uh, inside of uh, globally interconnected uh, telecommunications and computing uh, computing infrastructure so we uh, performing our businesses or our, our missions are embedded in the same global networked environment that our adversaries are embedded in. So this presents a uh, nearly infinite uh, uh, way for adversaries to get at our uh, information, get inside of our thinking, uh, uh, steal our intellectual property, and perhaps uh, also disrupt, disrupt our missions. I guess it's probably worth repeating something that we know, but it sometimes eludes us uh, how to respond to it, is that attacks and probes are continuous. Unlike when you were isolated, you could see a discrete attack and maybe it, something happened, maybe something di didn't. But now you're pretty much living with this second by second. Yes, so the, the, uh, the way that we're thinking about threat um, is uh, really along two dimensions. First, we are trying to understand threat from a capability perspective, going from uh, relatively uh, weak uh, adversarial capability, tools uh, only available on the internet, uh, all the way up to uh, sophisticated uh, nation state actors that have uh, tremendous investments uh, in trying to understand latent vulnerabilities uh, in the technologies that we're using, uh, and also with the tradecraft to actually introduce vulnerabilities uh, into the infrastructure through uh, our supply chains. Uh, and so that's one dimension that we're thinking about it. The other is the attack life cycle. So how uh, an adversary can essentially uh, move through through the phases of trying to gain reconnaissance on the infrastructure all the way to uh, uh, gaining a foothold, moving laterally, and then ultimately uh, doing the intended damage, uh, whether it's, again, theft of intellectual property or uh, disruption of, uh, and then basically maintaining control over that infrastructure and then eliminating all traces of themselves. So, so the idea is we're trying to understand threat along both of those uh, dimensions. Some aspects of them change very, very rapidly. Uh, for instance, as technology changes pretty, 
as it does very rapidly, the specific exploits that are the specific threats are going to change equally rapidly. But at the level that we've described of, of what a capable adversary looks like, we think that those things change and evolve more slowly. And then in between those two is what is the characteristic of the particular actors. Uh, what, you know, they can, that will evolve over time. We find that generally adversaries get more capable over time, particularly the low-end low actors become more capable as tools are available for them on the Internet. So dealing with a specific threat, important as that is, I guess equally important is the, I guess the organizational agility and adaptability to keep changing sometimes daily so that you can meet whatever the new threat is. So that, that's, that's, that's a good point. So ultimately, I, I think that the, the, we do have to be able to evolve uh, systems in a number of ways that address the point that you just made. One is that as uh, new vulnerabilities are discovered uh, and we're able to fix them, we need to be able to, to fix them very rapidly uh, and at scale. Uh, but more challenging is the fact that our systems need to be able to evolve architecturally so that fundamental uh, changes in technology can be accommodated and fundamental new threat capabilities can be, can be addressed. Um, and that reflects the fact that cybersecurity uh, ultimately is implemented architecturally uh, at the particular technology component level as well as in our processes. Sure, okay, good. Well, good way to uh, frame the discussion. And Servio, you may not have a tactical environment in DOD, but you have one that's equally exposed, equally sought after in some ways by different actors perhaps, but equally sought after, and that is the, the health domain and the records related there too. So tell us more about that. That's exactly right. A, a little bit about myself first. Um, I currently serve as this policy branch cybersecurity chief for the Defense Health Agency, and the DHA was only established about four years ago to centralize and standardize support to the military health system. So instead of Army medicine, Navy medicine, Air Force medicine way of assessing for risk and authorizing to operate, centralizing that, which brings in some cost efficiencies and efficiencies of execution. Um, when I tell people what my title is and what I do, which is cybersecurity policy, I often get chided that that must be a really exciting job to be creating cybersecurity policy all day for a living. But I, I quickly clarify that it's not, that's not a, a fair characterization. One, DOD creates policy. DHA executes the policy. So yes, there may be instructions that are created by the DHA, and, and the director, Admiral uh, Raquel Bono, is the director of the DHA, and she signs out instructions which implement DOD policy, but while it may seem like a hair split, it's, it's an important distinction. And secondly, and this is where I may be complimenting Mitch in technical versus policy and people, where my focus is. There are so many policies that people are simply not aware of partially aware of, or they misinterpret, they misunderstand, and that leads to variations in implementation. So one of the primary objectives that I have Im brought into my office is how to promote greater awareness and understanding of existing policies, of existing processes. And if I may, just by point of introduction, uh, before my career started in the military health system, I taught math and computer science at the college level for 10 years. So. As a recovering educator, I'm pretty excited to be bringing kind of meaningful understanding of cybersecurity requirements to the person's desk when they're at the keyboard. When they're not at the keyboard, a lot of people think cyber stops when you leave the keyboard. Um, it, the medical device does not have to be networked mm -hmm. for it to be compromised. Mm -hmm. So how, in a way, if I may, how are we raising the bar of cyber hygiene mm -hmm. across the military health system? Small steps. Um, and Tom, yes, you mentioned uh, healthcare. Today, if you, it doesn't matter which study you look at, whether it's Panaman, Trend Micro, Verizon, healthcare is under attack. So we, the, the DHA is looking at an additional complexity. I was talking with Mitch about this earlier. 
HIPAA compliance, HIPAA security, HIPAA privacy is another factor in addition to cybersecurity that has to be considered when we're looking at our systems. So we're looking at what is best for patient care while maintaining the safeguarding of protected health information, personally identifiable information, in addition to the tenets of cybersecurity, confidentiality, integrity, availability, et cetera. And it's interesting too because the DOD is adopting a commercial provider's electronic health record that is in turn shared at some degree with millions of other records and thousands of other institutions that use that. And so that puts you, you know, as Mitch put it, you know, embedded in the same ecosystem as those that you're trying to thwart. That's right, and um, Admiral Bono has spoken to this at HIMSS and other, other events. Um, it puts DHA in a more competitive arena for the use of IT that's more cutting edge versus creating um, something in shop using COTS or GOTS to leverage the latest tools mm -hmm. that others in the industry are using. Okay, Keith, uh, Lidos has a pretty big footprint in a lot of different agencies, big company. You've got a good overview of all of DOD. What are the pain points your customers are expressing to you and what are the trends you see? Well, um, as you, just as, as from my background, I'm the Chief Technology Officer for Lidos, uh, and in that role I am responsible for uh, understanding the, the technology landscape. Cyber is one of our core competencies. Uh, we feel we're very strong in cyber, um, and uh, in addition, delivering uh, health healthcare record systems to uh, uh, defense, uh, VA, uh, other places like that. Uh, our role in bringing COTS in is to make sure that they, they do meet security uh, policy, um, and and uh, are robust uh, to defend against uh, threats and protect privacy, uh, personally identifiable information, um, and, um, and obviously the uh, the mission uh, of our customers. Um, so, you know, what we see uh, in the the threat landscape and working with our customers obviously is a uh, a uh, a robust cyber workforce that is developing. Um, as, as the college graduates are, are uh, maturing, um, but this cyber workforce isn't necessarily just employed by us, it's employed by our adversaries, um, and also uh, freelance. Um, and so that the, um, you know, as, as Mitch was, was talking about, the fact is uh, it's not just a, a nation state or a rogue state or a hacker, it's, it's everything in between. Um, you know, one, one, one thing we've found is um, there, there is a robust marketplace uh, for, for cyber effects. Um, and uh, you know, right now you can go buy um, you know very very powerful um, uh, uh, exploitation mm -hmm. uh, capabilities. Uh, you can you can purchase uh, for higher uh, vulnerability vulnerability uh, analysts uh, to go look for threats and look for doing the recon phase, as you mentioned. Um, and so that marketplace is something that's just. Uh, uh, a reality and maturing. Uh, just like any market where there's uh, potential to make money, uh, there's going to be uh, uh, efforts to uh, exploit uh, that, uh, that capability. Uh, another area that we're seeing is um, just uh, uh, the, the points of ingress uh, into systems. Uh, uh, despite our efforts to try to control that, uh, um, you know, there, there are just richer ingress points because of uh, this requirements for mobility, just in, in, just in uh, a move from uh, desktops to laptops. Uh, uh, medical devices, obviously, is a, is a big area that we're that we're they were addressing, um, and then also motion, moving into the, the non-IT world, the operational world, uh, SCADA systems uh, for some of our um, uh, some of our customers who are who are working on operational mm -hmm. uh, capabilities, uh, and then uh, moving into military. Um, you know, hardware, weapon systems, and how do you really address cyber across that broader, um, you know, uh, you know, system of, of 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 capabilities that we need to protect. Um, so um, that's kind of our my our take uh, from from industry is that there is a, just a broader marketplace and a broader uh, set of ingress opportunities and exploit uh, opportunities to exploit than ever before, um, and so that's what we're focused on addressing uh, from a, uh, a capability perspective, and then looking to see how we can automate a lot of this hygiene so that we can move up the scale to address the more sophisticated threats. Okay, that point is a good one, hygiene and automation. It gets back to something I think that Mitch said, and that is uh, the architectural uh, approach to networks has to change. And you didn't quite put it this way, but I got the impression you were driving at the idea of the automation of network resilience so that networks respond to cyber threats. 
because of the velocity of threats is getting to the point where it's, people can't react that fast. Right. Yeah, so I think that um, the, the evolution in, in technology is enabling certain architectural concepts that we've had, I think, for a while. Uh, but it, couldn't but couldn't do, could not execute mm -hmm. because the basically most of those architectures were implemented in hardware and and uh, whereas today uh, with the emergence of uh, you know strong virtualization capabilities uh, both within the networking environment and now uh, within uh, uh, you know kind of cloud technologies. Uh, 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 virtualization with the within the data center, uh, what that's allowing us to do is is implement a capability to have the network itself and the computing infrastructure itself respond to uh, an evolving threat. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is kind of an, uh, this is an important idea from the uh, standpoint of network uh, resilience within the department. Uh, we have um, uh, working within our with our joint staff and and looking at requirements for systems in the department. We've recently uh, implemented a system survivability um, uh, key performance parameter for our uh, military systems. Um, and fundamentally, what this requires is that the components that are uh, championing uh, the creation of a of a military system actually describe. Uh, the uh, non-kinetic contested environment that the system is going to have to face, including you know electronic warfare, but also including uh, cyber, uh, the, ultimately the threat environment sure. that a system is going to have to take. The fundamental architectural concept that that we worked out as we were thinking through that addresses the trade between information support to the system. So. Uh, generally, systems, uh, uh, you know, I work in ideal circumstances with very robust information support, uh, but that actually expands the attack surface for those systems. And so, uh, sometimes you need to be able to dial back that information support and operate in a in a degraded mode. So, all these kinds of changes, uh, in order to do real time, requires very powerful situational awareness at the network and computing levels, mm -hmm. uh, man, man out of the loop, uh, and then have the ability to have the network and computing infrastructure respond, essentially reducing uh, the attack surface for those systems. Okay, we're going to continue with that discussion after this short break, but we do need to take a break right now. This discussion is cybersecurity in today's DOD, sponsored by Lighthouse, here on Federal News Radio 1500 AM and federalnewsradio.com.